In 1982, a fresh-faced, young, dumb, and full of gum, Pat Man QC sat down to watch the very first episode of a new series entitled Knight Rider. The series follows the exploits of Michael Knight, who along with his high-tech mouth on wheels known as Kit, travels the country doing his best to stamp out crime and injustice everywhere. This isn't just any talking car, though. This is a highly advanced, self-aware machine that doesn't take any guff off anybody. Next to the 1966 Batmobile, there wasn't a cooler car around. For my 10-year-old self, this show had it all. Who is Tat and how does he factor into our story? What science fiction classic inspired the red beams on the front of Kit? So drive as fast as you can and hit the turbo boost because this is the history of Knight Rider. The year is 1981 and producer Glenn Larson is looking to create his next hit TV show. He had already developed other properties such as The Six Million Dollar Man, Battlestar Galactica, Fall Guy, and Magnum P.I. One big inspiration for the new show would be The Lone Ranger, but instead of a faithful sidekick by the name of Tonto, he wanted the main hero sidekick to be a futuristic card that was self-aware. The Lone Ranger would drift across the plains righting wrongs with his faithful ally Tonto by his side similar to what Michael Knight does with Kit. Mr. Larson wrote the pilot script in 10 days which NBC approved and immediately greenlit the pilot. Soon the network interference began with such peculiar notes as the car shouldn't talk, the car should talk but have a female voice, and that David Hasselhoff was not handsome enough to be a leading man. Thankfully, Mr. Larson stuck to his guns. The series ran from 1982 until 1986 for a grand total of 90 episodes. The series revolves around Michael Long, who was an undercover police detective that was brutally shot. He is rescued by billionaire Wilton Knight, who gives Michael plastic surgery and also a brand new last name of Knight. Michael is selected by Wilton to be the primary field agent in the Foundation for Law and Government, or FLAG for short. Michael's partner in all of this is the Knight Industries 2000, or KIT for short, which is a technologically advanced, heavily modified Pontiac Firebird Trans Am that is also self-aware. Aiding him in his mission is the spokesperson for FLAG, Devin, who provides mission details to both Michael and KIT. For seasons 1, 3, and 4, we have Bonnie, who is the chief technician for Kit and sometimes romantic tension for Michael. When the second season rolled around, Bonnie was out and April was in as the primary chief technician for Kit. Long before he was running along the beach and eating cheeseburgers off the floor, David Hasselhoff portrayed the title character of Michael Knight. The voice of Kit was provided by William Daniels, who was best known for his role on the TV show Saint Elsewhere. When Mr. Larson wrote the script, he had one voice in mind for the role of Kit, and that was Daniels. Initially, they had wanted him to attempt a robot voice for Kit, but he felt this was unnatural. He decided to use his own natural speaking voice, feeling this would give a more human side to the beloved car. Bonnie was portrayed by Patricia McPherson until she was unceremoniously fired after the first season. Hasselhoff and Larson were both instrumental in bringing her back for seasons 3 and 4. She was replaced in the second season by Rebecca Holden who would portray Kit's other chief technician, April. Devin was played by Edward Mulhair and we have the narrator which was actually Wilton Knight played by Richard Basehart. He only appeared in the pilot episode, but his voice was used in the intro and outro. Daniels and Hasselhoff never even met each other until the Christmas party six months after the show started filming. As I mentioned, Kit was a heavily modified Pontiac Firebird Trans Am, which supposedly the first two production models off the line went straight to Universal for the making of the series. A total of 23 Trans Ams were used in the series along with various models and miniatures. The primary filming car, otherwise known as the Hero Car, was the only one that had the intricate dashboard used for close-ups. Growing up, I was infatuated with the dashboard of Kit and all of his wonderful gadgets. The problem was, we didn't have a VCR at the time so I wasn't able to pause the screen to get a better look. 
Thankfully, with the series release on DVD and other streaming platforms, we now have a crystal clear picture and were able to see exactly what was on Kit's dashboard. The original name of Kit was TAT, or Trans Am 2000. Partway through filming, Pontiac went to the producers and asked that they stop referring to the car as a Trans Am because people were coming to the company asking where they could purchase one, especially one with a red light on the front. At this point, Michael started referring to the car as a T-top instead. The scanning red light on the front of Kit was inspired by Larson's other creation, the Cylons in Battlestar Galactica. Speaking of red lights, the voice modulator that was used whenever Kit would talk is because Mr. Larson wanted the car to have a heartbeat to go along with the voice. The modulator did go through a design change in Season 1. George Barris, who also created classic TV cars such as the Munsters Coach, the General Lee, the Beverly Hillbillies Truck, and of course the Batmobile, helped design Kit as well. The classic theme song is a mixture of Cortez de Bacchus and also Harry Thuman's Sphinx. Take a listen and you'll hear what I mean. There are a lot of good episodes, but my favorite would have to be Trust Doesn't Rust, in which the world is introduced to an evil version of Kit by the name of Car, or Night Automated Roving Robot. Car was voiced by the legendary Peter Cullen, who did the voice of Optimus Prime on the Transformers cartoon. It's pretty cool seeing the two dueling cars go at it at the end of the episode. Detect numerous purveyors of food. Please tell me where you wish to go. Uh, how about the three rings? Another episode that, while not quite as good as the previous one, is Goliath, in which Wilton Knight's estranged son, Garth Knight, is played by an evil mustachioed David Hasselhoff. As the series progressed, Kit started getting more and more gadgets, including Super Pursuit Mode, in which the producers have said was added just to increase viewer interest. The show was a ratings hit from the get-go and actually had the pilot episode shown three times during the first season. After these messages, we'll be right back. Kit here was designed to do the impossible. And I do. But wait till you see this. Rock Riders Impossible. The Knight Rider Impossible set takes on impossible angles and hangs tough. With all this twist and turn and track, this car does things even Kit can't do. Now, wait a minute. There's also the Kit Computer Headquarters to charge up and move out. Hey Kit, this set is really something. Don't get carried away. The Knight Rider Impossible Set from LJN. Of course, if you had a hit TV show that was geared towards kids, there would be lots of merchandise. We received everything from model kits, crash sets, lot cars, die cast cars, and the coolest collectible which I always wanted as a kid was the Knight 2000 voice car, which included a large version of Kit with opening doors, a Michael Knight figure with David Hasselhoff's trademark poofy hair. But the absolute best feature is that the car would actually speak six lines by pushing down on the license plate. Push the license plate. Night 2000 voice car says six different things. Sequence may vary, batteries not included. And it comes with a Michael Knight action figure. Scanner indicates danger ahead. Kit, save me, hurry! This was Knight's lucky day. The Knight 2000 voice car comes with a Michael Knight action figure. From Kenner. Midway through Season 3, ratings had started a steady decline, and by the end of Season 4, it was all over for Knight Rider. After 90 episodes, Michael Knight and Kit would ride off into the sunset looking for their next adventure. 
There have been a few attempts over the years to revive the series, including Knight Rider 2000, which was a TV movie that starred David Hasselhoff and William Daniels back as the voice of Kit. Knight Rider 2010, which aside from a talking car, had little to do with the original TV show. And Team Knight Rider, which was a team of high-tech crime fighters put together by Flag. This was a TV show that lasted 22 episodes and ran from 1997 to 1998. Another made-for-TV movie was released in 2008 simply titled Knight Rider, which served as a backdoor pilot for a TV series. Val Kilmer provided the voice of Kit and David Hasselhoff had a brief cameo as Michael Knight. A series was commissioned and ran for 17 episodes before it was canceled. There have been a few video games based on the series starting with the 1986 Ocean Software release on various 8-bit computers. Apparently the game was delayed by 18 months and this was the direct we were given when the game was finally released. To be honest, I've had better bowel movements than this. It looks like it was cobbled together over the course of a three-day bender just narrowly missing a deadline. Of course, with any TV adaptation, the graphics are not going to be up to snuff, especially on the technology we had available at the time. Good graphics are only part of the equation, as it has to have good gameplay, which unfortunately, this one falls on its face. You can either control the car itself or choose to shoot missiles out of the sky. On the Commodore 64 version, you can at least go off the road, but with the Spectrum and Amstrad versions, you have an invisible barrier that will not let you. At the conclusion of each driving level, you enter an operations building that is viewed from an overhead perspective similar to the arcade game Crackdown. You control Michael as he navigates the building while avoiding all the guards. If you happen to make it to the end of the level, you are given a clue related to the terrorist plot. You then select another city and repeat the whole process. The sound effects are pure queef nasty, but at least the 64 version has a decent rendition of the Knight Rider theme. I've played some bad racing games in my life, including Chase HQ and Hard Driving on the 64, and while this one isn't as bad as those, it's not very good either. The NES version is the one most people are familiar with and it's really not too bad. Let's get Captain Obvious out of the way and just point out that this is a Chase HQ clone, but what else would you expect from a game based on a talking car with weapons out the wazoo? There is some slowdown and it comes from the developers trying to put too much in too fast, which is kind of how I ended up with my daughter. As the story goes. Terrorists have infiltrated a U.S. military site and it's up to Michael and Kit to chase them across the country and thwart their dastardly plans. There are two modes available with the first one being a mission or story mode. The game is similar to both Chase HQ and with a little bit of machine gun loving from the arcade game Road Blasters thrown in. There are three types of vehicles in this mode. Red, which are the enemies. Blue, which are the civilians and yellow who are the enemies that carry power-ups. If you shoot blue vehicles or civilians, deductions will be made from the timer. There is some slowdown and it comes from the developers trying to put too much in too fast, which is kind of how I ended up with my daughter. A third of the screen is taken up by the heads-up display with the red scanner that should be facing out towards traffic, for some odd reason is facing towards you. That is a pretty big detail to get wrong. After getting your assignment from Devon, Bonnie will give you five upgrades to add or remove as you see fit. You race around the country chasing bad guys with various weapons such as machine guns, lasers, and missiles. You only start with the machine guns as the other two need to be acquired. You also have your turbo boost to use which is great to get you out of a tight spot. The game does have various power-ups you pick up including time extensions, gas, and more lives. A handy and dandy password feature is also present. The graphics are done fairly well, but if you stripped off the kit heads-up display, you would have no idea this was a game based on Knight Rider. 
The sound effects are okay, but the iconic theme song is completely missing. Knight Rider Special was released for the PC Engine in Japan and it seems like an enhanced version of the NES title. This is even more so a straightforward Chase HQ clone but with better graphics, sounds and playability. We do get some pretty good scaling effects with the road and all the curbside objects. Unlike the first person view found in the NES version, this one features a third person perspective very similar to OutRun and, surprise surprise, Chase HQ. Aside from the various jet fighters and other cars that are armed with rear guns, your biggest enemy is the clock, but thankfully there are checkpoints that you can reach. You are only given 60 seconds to go from area to area. You are geared up with a pair of machine guns and also the trusty but perhaps rusty turbo boost function. As the game progresses, you earn upgrades to add the kit's overall abilities and defenses. There are some nice jingles while we play, and even the iconic theme song at the start of each game. The gameplay is good with nice, tight, responsive controls over your car. Overall, it's a fun little game, and I enjoyed this much more than the NES version. It's just too bad that the digitized samples they use for Kit's voice are in Japanese. Knight Rider The Game was released for PlayStation 2 and PC in 2004. A lot of people gave this game grief when it was released, but if you are a die-hard fan of the TV series and racing games, then you will look past the vault and love what's there. No, the game isn't perfect, and yes, the game is a bit buggy. The voice acting is also a bit on the weak side, but the gameplay is still fun with you having control of Kit, driving around with Michael, getting into various adventures. The game is a definite love letter to the mythology of Knight Rider, including characters such as Bonnie, Devin, Carr, and also the true son of Wilson Knight, Garth Knight, used throughout its storyline. Speaking of the voice acting, unfortunately, sound-alikes were used as David Hasselhoff nor William Daniels were involved in the project. The person they hired for Kit does a very good job at imitating him. The controls on the car itself are pretty good with you having the standard turbo boost as an option. It's a fairly long game as well, lasting just over a couple of hours. It does get repetitive, but it's still fun to play in my opinion. This was never released in North America. A sequel was released a couple of years later. Okay, we're here. Let's scan for clues. Scan initiated. Scan. Even modern video gamers can get a little bit of that kit loving such as the fan-made Knight Rider mod for Grand Theft Auto V. This mod proved to be so popular that Rock said he ended up releasing a fully licensed model for Grand Theft Auto Online. The car was also a DLC add-on for the game Rocket League. Knight Rider is high on my list when it comes to nostalgic TV shows from my youth. As I mentioned, the show had it all! The cool lead hero who just so happens to be a German pop star. A cool high-tech car and plenty of action to boot. Not to mention all those wonderful toys that we had to play with while watching it on TV. If you've never had a chance to check out this classic TV show, be sure and give it a shot. You'll be glad you did. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Also, if you would like to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. Thank you all so much for watching.